Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Appreciate you hearing me this morning. Um, I'm a student at UNH. I'm an environmental economics major and a senior this year. I've taken a lot of botany classes and have studied industrial <coughs> hemp personally, um, separate from my studies for a while. I just wanted to clear up a couple of things with a background as specific as that. Um, although cannabis and hemp are essentially the same plant, if they are planted nearby each other, they will cross pollinate. And the buds that are produced on the marijuana plant will be ruined because they will go into seed, which, will be, which can be harvested as an industrial hemp crop separate from the fiber. And it cannot be smoked in that form. There's very low THC value in hemp products. That has been a large, large fight in Europe and in Canada, is finding these new strands of industrial hemp that have lower than 1% THC value in them so that they don't actually have the qualities to get a smoker high. You would essentially have to smoke a football field of hemp to try and get high. It probably wouldn't even work at that point. So they are two very separate things, and they get in the way of each other when they're grown together. So in that way, if we did, say, legalize hemp tomorrow and plant it all across the state, we could eradicate all of the outdoor, illegal marijuana growing operations in the state by cross-pollination, which is a pretty interesting thing. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on, a lot of the processing plants that already exist for paper, specifically in our state, could be immediately transferred over to process industrial hemp herds to make paper much more sustainably um, and with much less chemicals and bleaches um, and with a lot less water pollution coming out the other side, which is pretty interesting, um, as well as the development of new processing plants in the state may offer a new economic boost in an industry we haven't even gotten into yet, which is pretty interesting to turn away from when we're in such an economic problem right now and we're looking for new marketable solutions. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to touch on is the value that, excuse me, that can be added by adding industrial hemp into a crop rotation for a farmer in New Hampshire. Um, it increases the nitrogen levels in the soil when the rootstock is left behind when you harvest the plant. This is better for the next crop that you plant on top of it. Um, it also builds a better water to air ratio in the soil, which is really great if you plant corn directly after because it makes it a lot easier for the roots of the corn to take. Um, in a similar way, if you plant it before you plant a soybean plant, um, it actually destroys a nematode that gets all over the soy and destroys those crops. So it's a really interesting plant in, in being added to a crop rotation in the state because it offers a lot of more natural and less herbicidal solutions to a lot of the, the problems that our uh, American farmers are facing right now. Um, another thing to just add on that, the way that the plant grows, it's very different from marijuana, it's planted very closely together, and in that way it reduces the number of weeds that can grow below it. It's a very quick growing plant and has a very, very high frost tolerance, so it can be planted very early. And it tends to beat out a lot of weeds. Um, so in that way, it's a very good cover crop to start out uh, a planting season. Um, I just want to know one other thing. When we went away from the hemp industry, the reason that other pharmaceutical-driven fabrics, etc., were better is because they were cheaper at the time. They were more accessible. Oil was really easy to find, really easy to process, really cheap to make. Hemp took a lot of time. There wasn't a lot of machinery at the time that allowed us to process it in a cheap and quick way, and that uh, definitely aided in hemp's defeat um, through marijuana legislation. And I'll wrap up there to keep it short, and I offer any questions, please. Representative Burley, you get second, but don't you, uh, does your statements defer, I mean, are they different than the federal government statements uh, with the uh, hemp? And marijuana. I mean, because we have federal statutes, would you believe? And I'm sure there was quite a bit of testimony that was given uh, where the federal government made it a crime, uh, more or less. So I'm sure they had many people with a lot of knowledge also in that area when they gave their testimony to be against it. Would you believe? I, I could believe that, sure. I, I could also believe that they were attempting to destroy a drug and they were attempting to keep that out of the hands of the citizens. And because of the very close uh, relationship between cannabis and hemp, 
It's very easy for them to be kind of tossed together if you don't have an understanding of the difference of the plants. Um, and I could see, I could easily see how it could be defeated in a, an attempt to eradicate drugs. Well, so actually you do de disagree with the federal government uh, how they came about of uh, making hemp uh, illegal. I do, yes. I think that a lot of the folks that were working on making marijuana illegal were also had money in petrochemicals and other companies that would have been hurt by a, a growing hemp industry at the time. Thank you. Thank you, young lady, for taking my question. Uh, in your research that you've done, have you come up with any reason why uh, we haven't made this legal in the United States, There's other than feeling that the federal government can be with money? Yes, thank you. Uh, a lot of it is definitely the federal government, but I would say a lot of it still is the lack of education and the facts that these are two different crops and that hemp is not a drug and it has no drug qualities. But unless someone is, is coming out and saying that at every you know hearing and everything like that, there's, there's no space for that education to happen. So I, I would blame that, perhaps, um, as well. Uh, you were, in your testimony, said this was very good for the soil and whatnot for the farmers. Um, with all the problems we're having with farms, why haven't the farmers got together and asked to grow this? It's illegal. They, they will be arrested for growing it right now. So we're kind of in that catch-22 of... Well, I mean, what I meant was why haven't they called to the um, Senate and the Congress and asked to there, there are bills being introduced. They get laughed off because everyone assumes they're talking about drugs. Um, that's, you know, a lot of what brought me here. I, I'm a farmer. I, you know, have a small garden at my home. I work on a large farm. And the, the benefit that a crop like hemp would add to my home alone is exceptional. But I'm not willing to grow it because I'm not willing to be arrested. And I know that that resonates with a lot of other farmers in the state as well. Thank you. Thank you. Just a curiosity. How long does it take from seed to maturity? Um, pretty sure 16? 16 weeks, yeah. And it depends too, you know, on the climate, on where you're at, on whether you're growing it for fiber or for seed um, or for both. That's pushing our seeds, our growing seeds. Yeah, absolutely. Are you familiar with the crab shots when I saw about hemp cord? Yes. Can you tell me, where does this manufacture? The manufacturing plants for cord? Yeah. Um, I don't know of any that are in the state of New Hampshire, but I do know of some old, old rope-making places down in Massachusetts and Connecticut specifically. Um, they're called rope walk buildings. They're extremely long, old brick buildings that probably don't have much of a use anymore. But it's where they used to bring all the fiber stock in and pull it together because in a botanist kind of sense, the, the length of a fiber, with all else held constant, determines the strength of the fiber. And cannabis actually, or hemp, produces the longest fiber, natural fiber, known to man. So they would take all of them into these long processing plants and keep the fiber as long as possible to increase the strength of them. But I'm not sure if any of them still actually exist up in New Hampshire. I was kind of curious about that because I, I use the hemp cord in my hobby, and uh, I've had occasion to have uh, shirts made from the stuff, and I didn't look at the country of origin, but uh, is this not Absolutely, yeah. It, it all depends on the way that you process it, too. Hemp can be made into something similar to a tweed, something similar to a linen, and also as fine as something like a silk. It depends on how much you, you tear apart the central fibers, how fine you make them, and then how much you process them together. Would this be similar to processing flax or linen? Yes, very much so. Yep, thank you. Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, I appreciate your research and your done. But however, in your research, you said we were speaking about processing plant or whatever. Mm -hmm. What was your research on what it would cost for a plant 
to do with this? Did you do any of that? I did, and it's very, very little cost. Um, a lot of the way that pulp paper, specifically, that was the, the citation I was using there, um, is produced, it's sort of run through water and pushed down into a solid form. At that point, there's a lot of chemicals that are introduced in a pulp paper sense um, to make it stronger, whiter, um, so that it's usable. And you could use the hemp hers, the uh, outside of the woody core of the stalk of the plant. Um, if you break those up in the same way you do pulp paper, you can run them through the exact same infrastructure and process them down. It doesn't require any chemicals to bind them together. And a very interesting thing about it, too, is the more that you recycle that sort of paper, the stronger that it actually becomes. Whereas in our normal uh, recycling process right now that we use for paper, we're required to introduce uh, either a newspaper or a harder paper into it to make it strong enough to be used again um, on the market for you know as an average piece of paper. So it's interesting that it's almost re rejuvenating itself in that way. Uh, I, I was actually wondering if you went to a place that did paper say in Berlin or something. Yeah. I did. And and what would it cost them? transfer or to add this to their plant, what would they cost you? I, I would you know, you're saying it's little, but did you get like a price range that would cost a company to change everything and work as a whatever? Right. Answer? Yep, I, I didn't actually go anywhere to any sites or anything like that, but the only cost that I would see of a plant facing would be the same import cost they would have for buying paper pulp or buying hemp stock. It would be the same sort of expense for expense for an input in their in their system. It would be essentially a straight substitute um, for a paper pulp in that way. Yes, thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Do you have a written testimony? I don't. I'm sorry. We'll take your notes. Okay, I can definitely give you notes. <coughs> Greg Polowski, I hope I didn't murder you. Oh, right. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's going to be a really hard and difficult and difficult to follow up on in the fall. Um, she's absolutely correct. And I represent an organization called NH Compassion and NH Common Sense. And the executive director, Kirk McNeil, McNeil could not unfortunately make it here today. But we are in, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm starting to get a little sick, so I apologize. Um, our organization happens to, uh, to agree and sponsor or approve of this bill. Um, our organization over the past couple of weeks, over the past couple of months, has been trying to outreach to multiple different organizations, and we're crafting letters of support from different organizations, such as the New Hampshire Sierra Club, New Hampshire uh, Institute for Agriculture and Forestry, as well as other groups, as well as other companies outside the state, in order to showcase to you folks exactly what type of cost benefit uh, we're talking about here in New Hampshire. Ms. Hall and I, with the Students for uh, Sensible Drug Policy, is working on a hemp industrial hemp feasibility report, and we would like to make that available to you as soon as we possibly can. We are going to be working, hopefully, with UNH uh, professors in order to compile this data. And I. And I encourage you, I encourage everyone in this uh, committee to take a look online to the different uh, areas around this country that have done feasibility reports, such as in California or in the Pacific Northwest Rim or Kentucky for that matter. Currently right now, there are four states besides New Hampshire that is currently taking up industrial hemp measures within their legislature, such as New Jersey, Colorado, New Mexico, and Kentucky. <coughs> Kentucky is huge on this, and they think that they have a foot or a, a stronger advantage over anybody else because they currently have uh, steps in place to create regulations and policies and an infrastructure that is that no other state in this union has. Regarding some legalities regarding uh, what the Department of Safety has mentioned before, <coughs> THC or industrial hemp is on the Controlled Substance Act uh, schedule because of its TAC content. But when we're talking about industrial hemp, and we're talking about the seeds that's grown from it, and then the sprouts and the stalk are all are grown from it, we're talking about a 0.3% THC ratio or percentage. Okay, and that is incredibly, incredibly minute. There are currently, and there are botanists out there that'll agree or disagree, but there are approximately four 
uh, three to four different strains of cannabis. Cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, uh, cannabis uh, ruderalis, and then ditch weed. Okay? And the, each one of those particular uh, strains or classes all have specific different THC levels. What we're talking about here is something completely, completely minute where the trace elements or the trace compounds are not even uh, basically reviewable. I mean, it's very, very difficult. Regarding how much product is actually uh, used here in the United States, the United States currently imports 75% of the world's industrial hemp usage. So to counter, to counter his uh, testimony, there is a huge need here in the United States. It might not, there might not be any processing or production plants here in, in New Hampshire, but I can far tell you right now that there is a huge, huge need for industrial hemp. Ford Motor Company, for example, in Canada, uses a ton of industrial hemp fibers in their auto parts and in their, fi in their fabri uh, fabrication of their body shells. Now, currently, right now, of course, Ford can't do that here in the United States. However, if you were to go back and do research online, if you look at Henry Ford, Henry Ford on his plant, his, his, uh, his mansion in Dearborn, Michigan, grew industrial hemp, created an industrial hemp-based car out of to use hemp ethanol, as well as its body panels and its glass, which were almost ten times as strong as, as steel. He actually physically took a hammer, a sledgehammer, and tried to just take it to the rear corner panel of this vehicle and could not even create a dent. How strong is this material? And also, to counter what the safety, uh, the Department of Safety said, is that this hemp, industrial hemp, <laughs> is so strong and it lasts almost forever. Any cotton t-shirt, for example, is going to shred compared to any hemp product made out of it. And I also I must contend or state this too, is that hemp is going to be the strongest and most long-lasting item that we could ever produce, as long as we still have the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution underneath glass. The Constitution, the rough draft of the Constitution, as well as the Declaration of Independence, were all written on hemp-based paper. That, I contest to you, is the longest and most durable product that will ever, ever be created out of hemp. I am open for uh, comments. Uh, so, anyway, that's about it. Representative Yes. Could hemp and marijuana be mixed together? Uh, can it be? Uh, well, cannabis and marijuana, yes, uh, theoretically no, correct. No, I'm talking about marijuana. You're talking about, yeah. well, okay. Uh, well, uh, to go back and state what, how you, the difference is between the two. Uh, anybody out of, uh, uh, out of, uh, Police Academy would definitely be able to tell the difference. They are trained currently to, to tell the difference. Now, what I mean by the difference is, an industrial hemp plant grows tall. Okay, what it is produced is the vast fibers. So theoretically, you need about a six-inch circumference in order to grow this because of the diameter that's going to be needed. However, in marijuana, in hold a second, in marijuana, the plant grows out to be like a Christmas tree, and therefore you need at least 12 to 36 inches in diameter in order for this plant to grow. So from a trained eye perspective, law enforcement is trained in order to review and look at this. That wasn't the question. What was the question? The question was, can you mix hemp with marijuana and smoke it? No, actually you cannot because of the low TAC content. Again, the, psych the, the Drug Control Substance Act is regulating the psychotropic element of, of the material. The TAC, tetracarbon, tetrac Delta 9, is the psychotropic drug element that is controlled on the Drug Substance Act. Industrial hemp, like I said before, has a 0.3% THC. Very minimal. You're not going to feel the psychotropic elements out of it, and I hope that addresses your question. Thank you. Representative Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you think that it was fair that the taxpayers would have to pay all this extra money to start analyzing all of the uh, hemp where it has mixed with marijuana, is it fair for our taxpayers of the state of New Hampshire when it is a federal law this time and statute that they have to pay for this? Well, I would have to say that to answer your question is that we're talking about creating regulations and rules to create businesses. 
And in a and as far as I saw on the Republican platform is that we're supposed to be, and I'm a registered Republican, so we're supposed to be creating jobs and we're supposed to be creating businesses. And I would not say that the state should do the testing. I would say that maybe as part of this process is that in order to construct a businesses to be able to to uh, to administer the testing, that they do it. And therefore, it is then encumbersome upon the person who is producing the material to get it tested, just as it is in any state that currently has this as, as well. Well, if the, uh, some federal agent was to arrest someone and they need to be incarcerated, could you tell me who would be paying the cost within our correctional facilities if it was, let's say, for uh, just a minor <coughs> crime? Besides, who would be paying for that? Besides the person who had already just been arrested, who was a taxpayer already, who was already paying for that? Hmm. Um, I would have to say that there are going to be fines and fees and, and other penalties that uh, someone who is incarcerated and uh, put to jail is going to be paying that back. So my question to you is, why could you not just have whoever was arrested for it to be able to pay for it? No, no. Yeah. We ask questions. Oh, I'm trying to answer the question. <laughs> Don't answer the question. The question. Unless it's the door. Thank you. Unless it's the door. All right. Let's represent it again to work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Major Connie said that uh, hemp is a subsidized crop in Canada, and that there are warehouses full of it that is not being used. What's your response to that? Unfortunately, I'm not a Canadian resident, so I have personally not been to Canada to see their warehouses or uh, a stockpile. Of it. All I can tell you right now is that if, if the world's production of industrial hemp, 75% is being imported to the United States for production, I, I, would, I would really have to say that whatever is in storage isn't there for very long. And number two is, I, I really can't answer that question because it's physically not there. I don't think the, I don't think the state could actually say that either. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Folks, have a great day. The last time we have a great year, which was my year. So I'm going to close this hearing.